today and welcome to our series, The Future is Female, which is part of a series that we're doing at the Columbus, Greater Columbus, Georgia Chamber of Commerce. And we're, we're so excited to be here with some amazing local women. And I'm Lori Alton, and I am owner of Focus Consulting Group, and I'm also a board member of the Chamber. And we're here to celebrate these amazing women in the Columbus region who are doing some fantastic things. And today we're going to focus a little bit on leadership and ask them some questions about how they've handled um, leadership and their organizations throughout this past year. And lastly, let me just say we couldn't do this series of programs without our uh, sponsor, TSIS Global Payments, a global payments company. So without waiting any longer, let's get started. Let me introduce you, first of all, to our distinguished panel. First of all, we have Audrey Hollingsworth, who is with Goodwill Industries of the Southern River. And Audrey, we're so glad to have you. Thank you. Next, we have Betsy Covington with the Chattahoochee Valley Community Foundation. Betsy, it's always great to see you. And last, but of course not least, we have Melody Trimble, who is with the St. Francis Emory Healthcare. And so what I've just asked each of these ladies to do is to kind of give us your 30 second elevator pitch, you know, your, your kind of your networking pitch and, and introduce yourselves that way. So let's see. Audrey, I see you on my on my right hand side. I'm going to ask you to go first. Sure, sure. Thank you, Lori. And uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I'll, before I do the 30 second business pitch, I'll just share with you um, that I am married to Selvin Hollingsworth, and I do have two adult daughters, Taylor and Sydney. Uh, I am a career HR professional and also a certified executive coach. As you mentioned, I'm Vice President of People Services with Goodwill Industries of the Southern Rivers. And, and I've been with Goodwill for about two and a half years now. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that we are one of about 156 independently operated Goodwills across the, the US and Canada. Um, our Goodwill serves about 50 counties. So we stretch from Villa, Villa Rica and Carrollton to LaGrange and Noonan Opelika, Phoenix City, Tifton, Albany, and, and Valdosta. Um, we, we are a self-funded nonprofit. And what that means is that 92% of the proceeds from our donated goods that we sell in the stores actually go to fund free services um, that, we, that we provide to our community. And, and those services include everything from GED training to job skills training, career development training, and we also have a veteran services uh, operation as well. A lot of people aren't aware of that. And since it is tax season, I will just add a shameless or unshameless plug here to acknowledge the fact that uh, during this season, we provide free tax preparation and pre tax filing services for those individuals who ha have an income of, of less than $57,000 a year. So I hope that folks will take advantage of that free service that's available during this season. Thank you, Audrey. I'm just sitting here thinking we could do a whole segment on, on the services that Goodwill yes. offers our community. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's just, it really boggles the mind when you think about it. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Betsy, I can see you next. Would you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. I'm Betsy Covington. I am the president and CEO of the Community Foundation of the Chattahoochee Valley, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that exists to help donors um, be great philanthropists in our community. And we, we really talk about um, part of the reason we exist is to create raging philanthropists. We want people who are so excited about the difference that they're able to make to improve our communities throughout the Chattahoochee Valley, that they want to do more of it. We are a 23-year-old organization that has assets of $240 million. Uh, we grant, uh, make grants to nonprofits like Goodwill and many others um, at about a $15 to $20 million level every year and represent some 330 different funds that do a lot of grant making in our community. So uh, a great staff that's um, marvelously curious about the ways we can help improve our community. Um, I'm also right now the chair of Columbus 2025, which is a great collaborative long range planning effort uh, for our multi-county area. And so it's a privilege to do that work as well. 
um, when I'm not at work, which is frequently these days. Today, I'm in my dining room office. Um, I am the wife of Rick Covington and have two adult children, Becca and Richard. And um, Cocker Spaniels who will need therapy once I get back to the office because they're so used to having me at home all the time. Oh, that, that, that's so funny, Betsy, because I, I have a cat. And so what I'm reading is that cats actually want us to go back to work. Oh. And so it's just, it's just very different. But I, I was also thinking as you were talking that your Betsy's footprint on our community is just so expansive in, in areas that people would have just no idea. That's nice. She's had her, her fingers in, and, and it's, it's true. And uh, so thank you for being here today. So Melody, tell us a little bit about you. Well, sure. My name is Melody Trimble. And as you said, I'm the CEO of St. Francis. I joined right before COVID hit um, in the early part of February of 2020. And what a year it's been. And as I look at these two ladies, um, both of them have a connection to the hospital and have served. So I think I'm the one coming in now. Uh, to this wonderful community and have been connected to both of them. Uh, Betsy in a very real way through the Chattahoochee Valley and the United Way. And then um, Audrey through her husband who serves on our board. And I hear all about her and the good work that she does. A little bit about me, I'm married. Um, my husband, Mike, and I've been married. We were counting up the other day, 38 years. We have two daughters, our oldest, Mary Elizabeth, who is a nurse, but doesn't practice right now. She practices being a great mom and helping at their school where her three children go, my three grandchildren, Hunter, Hayden, and Hannah. And then I have a younger daughter, Michaela, who just turned 31. And um, she's, oh, you can hear this. She's surprising her daddy Thursday. She's coming home and he doesn't know it for his birthday, uh, early birthday present. So we're excited to see her. So what do I do? Um, I have the privilege to lead um, St. Francis with a group of leaders and team members who inspire me every day. Uh, we are a full service hospital uh, in that uh, we offer critical care services, ER services, medical surgical services, and we stood ready through the last year that I've never seen anything like it in my 40 plus years in healthcare. Um, it has been interesting, it's been challenging, and, and uh, what I will say is we've learned to do things differently. The hospital has a wonderful um, cardiovascular program. It's what we're known for. Also, we have a women's program that's well-known, orthopedic program. Um, so we stand ready to help our community. And what I love about the mission of St. Francis, who's, who we're named after, is we've practiced it this year, is we do what's necessary so that we can do what's possible. And before long, all of us are doing what's impossible. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's what LifePoint stands for as well, is what our role is to make communities healthier. And I get the privilege to be in that healthcare sector, which every day gets to do that. And it's restoring health, but we have a very a strong connection with and a responsibility as a social partner in our community to align with our community to just do that, to make our communities healthier. So I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Melody. And, and I, you're probably the newest member to the community of this panel. And we are so fortunate to have you here. And we're, we're so glad that you are here. And, and as I've listened to each of you introduce yourselves, I heard a common theme of your mission-driven. Each of you is very mission driven your organizations are very mission driven and i could hear that in your in your introductions and so to say that this past year has been a challenge would probably be the understatement of the day or the week of the year but i want to start there because covid remains at the top of our our minds and it was almost exactly a year ago that it just felt like our world shut down and we had to adapt and adjust and to start trying to figure all this out. And so my first question is going to center around how has COVID 
in this last 12 months affected your organization? Now, Melody already alluded to it just a little bit, and I definitely mm -hmm. want to hear more about that, but how has COVID affected your organization and in what ways have you had to innovate to meet the, the needs? And so Melody, I'm gonna turn it back to you because I feel like you know most people think about the healthcare system. I mean, you guys have had to not just pivot, but reinvent. You know, it's, it's exactly right. What you said is there isn't really anything we haven't had to change or do differently. So I call it, we call it our COVID blessings. And as crazy as that sounds, um, I don't want to forget those lessons learned. And I think anytime we go through a pandemic or a crisis, that's what, when you're on the other side, Betsy says that all the time, when we get on the other side, well, we're getting on the other side. So when I look at what did we have to do innovatively, I'll give you one example. Who in the world would think that the amount of medication or the amount of protective wear materials or the amount of certain types of equipment that we have access to so easily readily available would all of a sudden become scarce? Who thought that hand sanitizer would be scarce? Who thought that we would never use a water fountain again in our lives? Everything we did who thought that we would have IV tubings and not enough plugins in rooms, but we had to decrease the amount of time we actually spend with our patients. That is counterintuitive to everything that we do because we were mitigating risk and exposure. And I think what, what you know, it's, it's like when, um, when it's so, the noise is so overwhelming. I think the one thing that we learned in COVID was, and, and you're going to kind of laugh, I tell people, it's almost like you have to think of the prettiest thing you can think of as a beautiful tree, and that's what I use, and as everything's bombarding at you, it is, okay, put it on the tree, okay, put it on the tree, because there's so much coming in there, and from that, then you're able to go, okay, now what do I need to take off first? What's most important? What do I have to do right now? Our command center has been up 360 plus days, that means every day we have met to talk about what's next. And even whether we went into COVID or out of COVID, we experienced three major surges. So every surge we thought, okay, we took a breath and then we came out of it. And I think the one thing that we had to be innovative on, and it's the one the most important was our team. Our team, we're good at crisis management. We're not good at, we are not great at a year long crisis management because we, it was like breathe. When are we gonna get that breathe? When are we gonna get to recharge um, that resilience? So if we won the battle of COVID and lost our healthcare providers and everyone involved in healthcare, then we lost. And we have had some um, unfortunate, we've lost team members, we've lost family. So, we had to do a lot of innovation around how do we support our team? And it looked different for every person out there. So what you might need and somebody else might need is very different. Um, so not only were we innovating care, innovating a vaccine, innovating remdesivir and all these new treatment modalities on warp speed, we were getting things. Everything we did to protect our patients protect our community, to protect our team, um, we did. And we're on the, almost on the other side. And I'm happy to say I'm so proud of these dedicated, and I'm, I call them just dedicated warriors because they kept going back. They kept showing up big every day. So I just think um, innovation, it was what didn't. Innovation to go get medication seven states away and have it flying in. I mean, I could go on and on. So just lots of innovation, lots of gratitude and lots of blessings. Well, thank, thank you for that. And, and I'm thinking, you know, as, as, as pe people can only press, right? Like pedal to the floor so long mm -hmm. until either they, they physically aren't able to keep going, they mentally aren't able to keep going. And that those kinds of bursts are usually short-lived but you've experienced 
a, a 12 month plus pedal to the metal with your team. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that is such a challenge and you felt it very, um, very intensely. And, and I think other, other leaders have felt it perhaps maybe not as in, intensely as in a hospital setting, but, um, Betsy, for example, how has it affected the community foundation? I mean, people's giving and your, how did you take care of your team? Well, I want to talk about that, but I, but before I pivot to that, I want to, since we're talking about leadership, I want to recognize, Melody, when was it that you arrived in Columbus? February 10th was my first day. February 10th. I mean, she, she was doing this incredibly difficult job to lead and motivate a team through an unprecedented time in our history when she had she was having to still think about how to drive to the office every day and I just really think that has been such an amazing thing to watch for for me that she jumped into this job as quickly as she did and has done what she's done for this community over that last year so I, um, it's funny, I know Melody's voice well, and we've been on a lot of Zoom calls. I still haven't met her in person, and I really look <laughs> yeah. forward to that. So, I know. what a very strange year. Um, you know, at the Community Foundation, we, we sort of can't believe that it's our job to help people love their community, but that's what we do. And um, so much of our work is about long term philanthropy. About 95% of our assets are endowed or long-term invested for the benefit of this community. During COVID, we've seen a bit more of a rise in the sort of short-term assets that come in and go right out because the community needed it. And people saw opportunity to meet needs in lots of different ways. I think probably the most visible for us has been the coronavirus response fund. And the story of that is not that unusual for the way things happen in our community. We are, we in this community come together quickly and well, and I think we do it easily. Um, when this crisis was on the horizon, I realized that we were going to need to do something to make philanthropy um, possible in an effective way for our community. And called my good friend and colleague, Ben Moser at United Way and said, what can we do together to be effective helpers in our community? And he was in, I mean, it, it 0.03 seconds, he was, why well, yes, let's, let's do this, let's set up a fund. And so March 17th, we launched the Coronavirus Response Fund. We also launched the Community Call, which is what Melody is probably referring to when she say, says that she's heard so much of me, she's probably sick of hearing of me. Um, we, we were daily on the community call for a very long time and then shifted to weekly and have gone to every other week. And we'll actually have our last community call. I'm a little bit sad about it, but not mm -hmm. really, um, on March 17th. And the reason that we're shifting is because this has gone from being an acute crisis to a more chronic crisis. And that call has been, I think, a really great way for nonprofits and governmental entities and medical entities, um, public health in our community to share information, to share what they were seeing on the front lines, to put up their hands as they had urgent needs. We, time and again, we saw, we saw volunteers come forward on that call. Um, it's been really helpful to us as grant makers from the coronavirus response fund perspective to hear what's really happening out there on the front lines. So um, that has been uh, a real roller coaster of emotion. You see needs in our community in um, a real close way. We have made grants right now of $1.3 million to organizations helping neighbors on the front line of this crisis. And those have gone for healthcare, food related needs, um, housing and shelter, some real basic stuff. And, and I've said over and over again, I feel like we all sort of slipped a few rungs on Maslow's triangle. People became very concerned with the health and safety and protection of their own families. And um, that's a scary place to find yourself in a community. So it's, 
it's been an interesting opportunity to lead through that with a lot of other great leaders in this community. While you do your regular job of helping philanthropists connect with other issues like racial justice, we've had so many great discussions um, at the local, state, and regional levels about how we can work better together to make sure that we are respecting and supporting and making it possible for each of our citizens to move forward in their lives. So these are big issues, guys. This hadn't been an easy year. Absolutely not. And, and nobody's gonna come out of this unscathed in some way. I mean, you just, everybody has felt all of these things at some level or another. And um, I heard you, I heard you talking about, well, I guess what I, what I thought I heard you saying was that you were involved with other leaders and you, you were kind of, almost like maybe you guys were tag teaming. Sometimes you had to step in and, and really take lead. Then, then you had other people to lean on, other, you know, whether it was yeah. Ben or, or other organizations, Melody, to lean on. Um, and so there were probably some really good leadership lessons in this past year, even though we weren't necessarily standing up with our hands raised saying, oh, teach me now. <laughs> no, I mean, and my staff, we have a small staff. We have a staff of five at the Community Foundation. And we've literally said, you guys, anybody can have a bad day and you can be as upfront as you need to be about today is not a good day for whatever reason, but we cannot all have a bad day on the same day. So whoever gets the slots first, the rest of you just have to suck it up and you get a turn tomorrow. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, so Audrey, tell me a little bit how, about how Goodwill has sure. responded to the crisis and particularly you as a leader. Sure, sure. Well, well first of all, I, I really want to acknowledge that one thing that I, I love about our community, and that is how we always do find a way to come together um, and support each other. And, and I think listening to Betsy and listening to Melody uh, kind of describe how those two entities and, and all the others across the community uh, worked together to figure out how to uh, navigate uh, through this kind of unprecedented time together is, is always very rewarding and refreshing for me. I, I don't know that other communities do that as well as, as we do. Um, and sometimes I, I always wanna be sure that we, we recognize the efforts that we, we make here in, in Columbus. Um, in terms of how it affected us, and I'll, I'll just start with just, you know, Goodwill Industries of the Southern Rivers for a moment, because it really was 12 months uh, ago. And, um, and because we are open to the public uh, on the retail side, and then of course, because we serve the community on the career services side, we, we had to shut down our operations um, to the public for six to eight weeks. But, um, but perhaps not very surprisingly, most people during that time found an opportunity to clean out their closets. And so they cleaned out their garages. And so we were, we were the beneficiaries of a lot of donations. So, so we kept our donor doors open and we literally had four and five levels of supplies. And uh, we're very grateful for, for the communities for, for those donations, because those donations, as I said earlier, um, we convert those to funds in, in order to provide the services to the community. So we're still able to benefit from those donations. And what that means for us is we're able to turn over kind of fresh new inventory more rapidly because we, we have a, a, a lot to choose from. Um, so, so that was something that was unique uh, for us, but uh, it turned out to be a, a real benefit for us. Some other things that, um, that we were planning to do that we didn't intend to do so quickly. One, we had, we had just come online with an e-commerce uh, operation. We started out with jewelry and books and we, we you know, stuck our toe in the water, if you will. But uh, when we had to close our stores and, and people weren't coming in to shop in the traditional retail way, as we all know, online shopping became a big, big hit. And so um, we were able to really accelerate a, a lot of the, the online product sales through, through e-commerce. So, so fortunately for us, 
it was already a, a project that um, that we had implemented, but it it took off like wildfire. We we didn't expect that, but we're very grateful for that. Um, and then we also were trying to look for ways to serve the community virtually, so we had to accelerate that. I'm I'm sure a lot of employers may have had new projects and initiatives that were hanging in the wings and, and COVID forced you to really accelerate um, some of those initiatives in, in order to look for ways, as you say, to pivot and still kind of serve those who need you the most. Um, and then of course, for our team members, we were trying to make sure that we could do everything and continue to do everything to help them feel safe. Um, we continue to social distance we, we still continue to, to actually conduct uh, temperature checks at, at our doorways. So whether you're coming in to shop as a retailer or whether you're coming in for career services, um, we're still doing temperature checks to make the community feel safe and also to make sure our team members are safe. Um, so we, we aren't very different in, in that regard. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we can find a, a healthy and a safe way to kind of Kind of practice social distancing and 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 still at the same time meet the needs of those who who need us the most thank you and you know like most of our listeners our our chamber members our our leaders who are listening your organizations you know we, you had to you had to respond yeah. and and yes. you, you you had to innovate in your in your own way and i think that's a lot of what our our business leaders uh, uh, that are listening. I think that's what they've had to do as well. And you, and you, it, it's hard to articulate the level of, of stress that that could possibly cause um, in, in so many parts of our lives. And so uh, let me, let me now kind of change direction. We'll lighten it up a little bit. And I'm going <laughs> to ask you a question about your, your leadership. And the, what I really want to know is who has been, kind of a, a influencer or even a leadership role model for you. It could be somebody local, could be somebody in your family, could be somebody mm -hmm. a bigger scale. But if you had to, I know <coughs> but pick many, if you had to pick one, who, um, who would you, who would you pick? So Betsy, let me start with you. Who, oh. I know, I know, I know. So for me, there are two that really have, um, so I get two, um, <laughs> who affect the way I go about my work every day. And, and the first is um, my dad, who Cecil Whitaker, who is a retired OBGYN in this community. And the reason I say my dad and not my mom, because she's quite wonderful too. But when I was growing up, daddy was the one who went to work every day. And daddy was the one who had found a calling in his life that he believed was what he was supposed to be doing to serve his world. He loved that work. He loved those women patients and all day long, um, every day I had modeled for me somebody who got great challenge and fulfillment and pleasure from the work that they were good at. And so I thought, well, that's what you look for when you look for a career, right? It's not a job, it's who you are. And the second one was um, Bill Turner. I knew Bill um, when I was growing up, I'm the age of one of his children and um, started going to his Sunday school class at St. Luke when I was in high school. And when my husband and I found ourselves back here in Columbus as young adults, he invited us to come be um, sort of junior teachers with him. And he had a whole series of people that he had rotated through that class. He taught senior high Sunday school at St. Luke for over 60 years. We can't decide if we were really good or if we were really bad because he sort of didn't let go of us. We stayed and taught with him for 23 years. And um, I love high school students. I always have. But what I got to hear from him on a weekly basis about leadership and love and loving people unconditionally where they are in a way that allows them to really be who they are um, and be real people and reach their potential has resonated with me forever. And the idea of philanthropy as the expression of love 
of people and belief in a community's ability to come together and um, do great things is, uh, is what I do for a living. I can't believe I've been this fortunate in my life, but I hear those voices in my head um, from those two people every day. Um, Bill is no longer with us on earth, but he speaks to me through this year, but my dad is still here and I hear his very clearly still living on a daily basis through my other ear. So I feel very, very lucky. Well, and Dr. Whitaker and Mr. Turner both walk the walk. I mean, anybody who has known either of them knows that they they both walk the walk and that those wonderful examples. Thank you. Audrey, what about you? Who is who has influenced you? Sure. So um so so I guess I'd I'd answer that question two ways. Um I, I'm gonna steal some of what Betsy said by by using my dad because he he too just had a very, very strong work ethic, um, you know, and, and he, you know, believed in giving a hundred percent, you know, he said, if you, if you're not going to give a hundred percent, just don't do it at all. Um, so, you know, he was sort of the quality control guru, <laughs> uh, when I, when I think about his style, but, but the other two qualities that he had one, he was very humble and very modest, but he was also extremely transparent. I mean, he was who he was and um, he was, you know, unapologetic about sharing his opinion, which I always admired and I respected that about him. Um, and believe it or not, he could get into a good debate with someone and always find a way to, to walk away with a, with a fast, long friendship. Um, and, and I always found that very interesting um, in terms of how he would always find a way to still build a relationship after a hard, deep, <laughs> lengthy, strong argument. <laughs> so he made a lot of friends in, in spite of the fact that he was always willing to be, be so direct um, and clear about his position. Um, but then the, the second thing that I would offer up, I mean, I'll have to say that I, I feel very fortunate that I've worked with some really great leaders throughout my career. Um, so it's really hard to call, you know, any one person by name, but, but I will say that the things that I, I will say that they all share in common is that they were always the kind of people who sort of pointed the way, um, but then allowed me to kind of chart my own course in, in order how, in, you know, in terms of how to get to the desired outcome. And, and that worked for me because it, it helped me to exercise a lot of independence. Um, I, I learned over the years how to rely on my own creativity and innovation to, to accept the fact that there are multiple ways to get to a particular outcome. Um, and it really has had a profound impact on just my own development, my own growth and, and my leadership style. Um, because it never felt very restrictive to me th throughout my career. And, and that, was, that was important for, for me in order to flourish. So, um, so I know you were looking for multiple names, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I will say that it was surprising to think about the things that were just common among the people that I had a chance to, to work with and to work alongside. Now your answer was actually perfect because the question, uh, on its face may, may seem like I'm asking for names, but really what it, the heart of it is, is qualities and characteristics yeah. of, of good leaders. And that's exactly what you both, what you both shared. And so sure. Melody, how about you? What, what about you? Oh, you're on mute. I said, this is the one I pondered the most on when I looked at the questions. Um, I think circumstances, are what they are. We're born and privileged into wherever we happen to be born and privileged into. And I think until you get to be an adult and you sit back and go, golly, how did I get to where I'm at? Um, it was that journey. Um, I'm a daughter of a military man. I have four brothers and I'm the only girl. That should say it right there. I, I mean, my dad and my mom, um, what I hear resonate, particularly Audrey with you, um, my, my dad was always off in some war or saving some country, um, but boy, he had five children and the person to the right and to the left of you children were who you depended on. Very military, but it was the brother to the right or the sister to the left, whatever happens, 
those are who depend on everything that you do. So whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability and that you're not alone. And if you give your word, then you better follow through. Uh, so those were great. And the mother always used to say, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Um, and I think my dad was always gone. There were actually six children in six years in my house, the oldest and youngest born on the same day. Absolutely, she needed us all to work together. So, and to this very day, um, we were the Kelly kids and the Kelly kids could roof a house. I could, I met my husband by fixing his car. No, I didn't need anyone to fix a car. I could roof a house but my brothers could iron clothes and clean and cook just as good as anyone else. So it's very interesting how, you know, that's just evolved in who I am. Um, I think over the years, it's hard for me to say one person because I feel like I'm Joseph's blanket and they're a color of many colors that every, I've always been a girl that just took something and those pearls of wisdom, you know, and had courage enough that the good Lord, first and foremost, the Lord gave me to walk through a door that seemed very uncertain to me, but he opened that door and I always thought, okay, you open it. I'm going to trust that you're with me and I'm going to go through it. And that faith was something that, you know, while maybe I didn't always have that in my home base, I tend to surround myself with people who are just very rich in courage and faith and purpose and knew that that was my heart of hearts, that that's how God meant me, that it was going to be very purpose driven. And it's interesting. I'm the only one in my family in healthcare, the only one that showed up in healthcare. My mother passes out with, you know, when you talk about it, my husband curls his toes when you talk about it, but me and my daughter ended up being in healthcare. And I think we are, those are just treasures. So I think throughout my career, I've wanted people to speak truth into me where when I needed to be better, tell me. Um, but I've also looked up to those icons of leaders that were the most humble leaders in the world. But when they spoke, it just resonated with me and I wanted to be like them. Um, I want to be, I have to have purpose driven. I, I don't just flounder. I, I can't do that. I believe God gave me 365 days out of a year and I don't want to miss a one of them because he has a, a mission so it's today what did I learn you know what's the plan I'm here and show up so um it's not real fancy um I do set goals now I actually have a coach now and it took me a few years in my 60s now so I have a coach and and I said it's been wonderful to have her help me just kind of bring some this kind of full circle because now it's really I want to coach and mentor those people who will follow me because guess what I'm going to need them just as much as I you know people need me today I need them too so that's kind of where I'm at and I love my family like I think my grandkids teach me every day and my children every day I learn something new from them so everybody will teach you you just have to be willing to learn well, you know, that's a good point because as leaders, we never stop learning, do we? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's never a, oh, I'm there, you know, I'm done, I'm there, I'm, I've arrived. And so, and I heard you talking about your, your coach and you talked a little bit about your dad. Um, now, when I think of, of military leaders, at least traditionally, I think of very, I have a very different image than I do of, let's say, a coaching leader. So can you tell me a little bit about your, what you would call your leadership style? What would your, what would you call your style of leadership? Me? You're, yeah, okay. Melody, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm very driven and I always have been. Um, I'm very energetic. Um, I, it just is. I, I don't know where it comes from. I think the big thing I would say is, um, I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I'll give you an example. Our home was destroyed in a tornado uh, in 16 seconds. Um, and everybody was, oh, are you going to cry or are you going to do that? I said, nope. It's about, come on, what do we have to do? What's next? You know, we're all living. We got to figure out what we're going to do. And I think that's what COVID was perfect. My kids said, mom, you, if you were not where you're at today in healthcare, we couldn't have handled you because you would have been 
you know, that is who you are. You're about being optimistic, staying calm when things are going crazy, um, figuring out how to do it and taking care of people. It's all about relationships and letting people know you care about them. And it's awful. And I don't try to sugarcoat it. But I think that's the kind of leader that I just am. I love you to death. I will love you and help you and support you. You just have to meet me. And maybe sometimes I'll love you more than you love yourself. And so that's okay. So I, to me, it isn't about the next notch on my belt. It never has been. It's about God put me where you can use me. You know who I am. You know my good and bad. Um, just put me where I'm at. So I, I just have been so blessed. I, I'm in healthcare and it's so diverse that um, I can't hardly breathe every time I leave a, a, a position. I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm leaving my family, my home, you know, but then I think, okay, he's going to take care of them just like he took care of me. There's someone to follow me. So um, it's all about relationships, doing your best, being better today than you were yesterday, and being very humble and grateful along the way. Great, great point. And, and I suspect that, that there, there is, it, it wasn't left to chance that you were put in your position in February of last year. I think I agree. <laughs> There's a, a lot saying this is what, this is the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. so, so Audrey, how would you describe your leadership style? Well, uh, well, I'm going to thank Melody for that nice transition talking about um, how she's relationship oriented, because I'll, I'll have to confess, I'm, I'm pretty relationship oriented too. Um, you know, I, I like to describe myself as a, as a quiet extrovert. Um, but, um, but as a result of that, you know, I, I really enjoy um, collaborating with others. So I, I would probably describe it as collaborative and participative because mm -hmm. I welcome and I invite diverse perspectives. Um, I love gathering insights and, and feedback because I, I think it helps to make smart decisions. Uh, I think you can build better mousetraps with, um, with, with more than one viewpoint um, sitting at the table. So that's always very important to me. Um, I, I especially enjoy working with people who care about their work uh, and take a lot of pride in their work because they're, they're gonna give you the best ideas that they have. Um, and, and then of course, I guess I'll, I'll have to admit that there's this, it's probably more of a cliche now, but um, the, the inverted pyramid that you hear people talk about in terms of servant leadership, um, mm -hmm. where you know the, the leader sort of sits at the bottom of the pyramid and their, their goal is really to serve others. others. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've sort of embraced that whole style years and years ago and, and can appreciate the value and the benefit of helping others to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. Melody referenced it earlier when she said, you, you know, you don't worry about who gets the credit. And so um, I've always been the type of person that I, I don't get bogged down over who gets the credit. Um, and if it's important to person A or B, you know, to have their light shine, then um, I'm, all, I'm all for that. Um, because I, you know, I think it's important that other people see that, that you care about their growth and, and their success. So, um, so yeah, I think I'd, I'd say perhaps, um, you know, there's a benefit to, you know, uh, accepting that the collective wisdom of a team helps you to, to get a lot further than if you're just rowing by yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And that, was said. Like, yeah, that was, that was very well said. So, so Betsy, what about you? What is your, tell us about your leadership style. Well, the truth is I'm listening to these other two women and thinking, oh, I like them. I, they, you know, you want, I really like what they said. I'm not somebody who spends a lot of time analyzing my leadership style. You could argue that maybe I should think about it a little bit more. I think it's built around the idea that we talk a lot in, in grant making about you avoid doing things to people, you want to do things with people. I get a lot more um, pleasure and fulfillment. And I think we do a lot better when we do them together. And, and part of it exactly is what Audrey was talking about. I think the outcome is better if you get diversity of opinion. Mm -hmm. I think um, people who feel empowered to work as a team 
um, have different expectations for how far they want to go in the community than people who feel like they're being managed one on one. Um, I just think it's a lot more fun to work with people who are excited about the big goals of making something better and making it bigger and making it more successful. And um, sometimes that's the harder work, right? It takes longer when you have a lot of people doing it together, but I think the outcome you get is a lot better. So um, beyond that, I don't know that anybody will outwork me. I love to work. I love what I do. I um, think I wish I were better at it and I want to be better at it and I mean to be better at it. And I get, I progress in that way when I bump up against people who make me better. So. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. I love that too. And, and as I listen to each of you, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, kind of like what you said, Betsy, I, I would love to work for any of these ladies. I could work for, I could report to they, you know, you, any of you could be my leader and I would be very comfortable. And if I had to, I love themes, part of my personality is I'm always looking for patterns and themes. And so part of what I, what I heard was that you, you quietly motivate people by inspiring. And I think you do that through that mission, that purpose. Mm -hmm. You live it, you talk about it, you share it, and then your energy and enthusiasm comes out. And then it's like, oh, everybody wants to be on board the train where people are having fun and they're, they're making progress. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a great lesson for business owners and other leaders is that you don't ever discount why you do what you do and don't hesitate to talk about why you do what you do because chances are there's somebody sitting next to you and maybe over here that are there because they want to do that too so thank you thank you all for sharing that another commonality within all of your organizations is that you're each kind of outward community facing and I would love to hear a little bit about why you think it's important for other people, other leaders, other just team members to be, to care about the community, to be involved in the community. Um, Betsy, easily, I can look at, I can look at you first just to, um, I know we could do like a whole day seminar on this. Yeah, I know. Well, because we need those people. I, I mean, you know, having just said what I said about believing that we go farther if we go together. We need those voices and everybody brings something to the table. I don't, I would, I mean, obviously what I do for a living is pretty community focused <laughs> exactly. But, but even if it wasn't, I mean, I haven't always worked in this field and um, I still feel like there's so many things we can learn from each other. And don't we all want, employees who feel connected to their communities. There's, there are more and more research, there's more and more research that talks about people who are connected to their communities are more likely to run for office. They are more likely to um, volunteer. They're more likely to be better neighbors who are connected to their street and their block and their neighborhood. They're less likely to um, litter they're less likely to commit crimes. I mean, those are people that we want in our community. And the secret is making them feel connected and connecting them to what's happening in our community. When we think about the future of our community, um, and it's, I believe the, the answer is the level to which we attract and retain and develop talent in our community. And talent and connectedness I think will largely determine our success over the next 20, 50, and 100 years in this community. Mm, that, that's a great answer. And I, just, the, just the word connected, people, people crave connection with other people, with their community. And you know, you talk about research, there's also research, research showing that people who are connected and engaged in their work, higher productivity, nicer to your customers, nicer to each other, and, and just 
tend to stay longer. So all of this, it's interesting to me, all this ties together. Mm -hmm. So Audrey, what about you? Why, why do you feel like people should be, should care about their community? Yeah, and, and, and Betsy, you, you know, you, you said it best. I love the way you said it. Uh, and, and I'll just simply have some follow on comments because, you know, we, we could really wrap it up with Betsy's remarks. But when I, when I think about, I mean, if, if you care about your community, you, you want to be involved. Uh, I, I think communities are able to thrive uh, and remain healthy when the citizens take an active interest in the, the, the quality of life in the community. We talk about live, work, and play, but in order for a community to be a great place to live, work, and play, it's because the citizens in the community care. Um, they care enough to get involved. They care enough, you know, whatever involvement looks like, whether you're volunteering for a nonprofit, whether you're serving on a board, whether you're attending town hall meetings, uh, whether you're organizing groups to take an active interest in cleaning up a community or a park, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the, the involvement looks like, um, just care enough to make a contribution to, to the community. That's, that's the way that they thrive. Um, and then, I mean, I'll go one step further and say, you know, spend your dollars locally. Um, all, of those, all of those steps are ways to help a community to really be successful and healthy and vibrant. And, uh, and, and if you care about where you live, um, I, I think you can't help but look for ways to, to find a way to make a contribution. Um, I, I think we owe it to our community and, and, we, and we really owe it to ourselves. If we're, if we're gonna live here, then you, you certainly wanna make it the best place it can be. Mm, that's, that's, that's well said too. And, and so many common themes here. Melody, what would you say? You're kind well, of I'm, to Columbus. So, so how would you kind of connect the dots here? A couple things I would say is this was a COVID blessing for me. You know, um, COVID, good, bad, or whatever, all of a sudden brought us all together real quick. It was our Joseph at the well. It was called COVID. And Betsy, I remember um, I met her early on and uh, thinking, oh my gosh, we're on almost daily. It was four or five hours every day of calls. But boy, did I get to know people really quickly and and connect to your point connectedness was huge and by the same token that's what COVID took away from us that connectedness so we had to work really really hard be very laser focused very intentional about making sure we're connected and I do think uh, one thing when all of us would meet we would talk about you know check on your neighbor check on someone else in the midst of fear, because there was so much fear about what was happening with COVID. And um, what I am so appreciative of, despite fear, uh, this team, you know, we connected to other communities to help them when they were in really bad shape. I think of Albany. Columbus did the right thing. At St. Francis, we did the right thing because we had to help each other. I think about, you know, when we talk about bettering our community how many I think of Mercer and I don't know why but there are I'm in the medical field and there's so many students who grew up here that went to school at Mercer and they're coming back home and they I mean I just interviewed two last week and they're like we want to come back home and we did clinicals at Mercer or Mercer at St. Francis and I'm coming home this is my community and if you don't hire me I'm going to get a job here somewhere I was like Okay, you, uh, that's half the battle. You want someone to want to be here. And part of what we do is to make communities healthier. And I love what we were saying, spend dollars local. I mean, in the midst of COVID, people were feeding us and so kind. I thought, y'all are not making any income. Listen, we turned right around and try. And I tell my team that all the time, whether it was United Way or supporting our local um, vendors is what could we do locally? Because that's dollars back home. That's dollars back in this community. Um, you know, it's, I just think that there's lots of ways. This is my home. I take care of my home. I make sure it's clean and neat and happy and painted and all those things. This is my home. You know, this is me, this is my home. So all of us, you know, my charge to my leaders now are, and actually I'm taking a poll, 
what are you connected in and what are we missing? Where are the gaps? Because guess what? There's a whole lot of us and there's a whole lot of Columbus. So how do we all get connected into those surrounding counties and, and have a olive branch that we reach out and help? And it's been amazing because people will, they're desiring to connect. They just want someone to hold their hand out. And they'll meet you halfway. So I've, I've been thrilled. I, I, you got me hook, line, and sinker when I got here. I just couldn't believe it. It was It's good Southern community. Good. We do a lot of things really well here. Yeah. And I love that each of y'all kind of touched on some of that. We have some challenges. And I think COVID has laid a lot of that bare. Generational poverty, we're seeing a spike in violence right now that's really frightening to me. It's frightening for a lot of reasons, but one of them is because to me, those are people who don't feel connected to the community or to opportunity. How do, what do we need to do as leaders to make sure that people feel that their voice can be heard and that there is a place at the table for them and this community? Those are the kind of things that I think about a lot. And I think we talk about it a lot at 2025, I'm not sure any of us have all the answers, but I want to celebrate what we're doing well, even as I say, how can we, how can we do it even better? That's a, that's a, that's a great point. And, and it makes me think about, I, I, I love courageous leadership. That's what I teach. It's what I coach. It's what I, I try to live. And Melody, you mentioned last year with fear. I mean, we've all faced fear but we were all still courageous. And, and so what that teaches us is that we can be both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be afraid. It's just not okay to withdraw and isolate and not participate. And so courageous leaders are scared probably mm -hmm. every day, all day. And, and maybe it's okay for us to just say that, that it's okay to be afraid. We can, we're still courageous. Um, let me just ask you, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up in just a minute, but if you could go back and talk to your younger self about 20 years ago, is there, is there one particular piece of advice that you would give to prepare your current self for what you're dealing with as a leader? Audrey, what would, what would your piece of advice be? <laughs> Wow. Uh, so, so that's, that's a very good question, Lori. And, um, and you probably learned a, a little bit ab about me just through our conversation today. So it, it's probably not a surprise that I would say, you know, that I, I typically, you know, live by the message, you know, work hard and play later. Um, and, and as a result, I'd say that I, I worked hard and I, I played easy. Uh, so I, looking back on it, I'd probably tell myself that if, if you're going to work hard, you really do need to play hard. Uh, I don't think I played hard enough. Um, I think the second thing that I would do is I'd tell myself to read the definition of self-care, <laughs> that self-care is not self-pampering, and it is not just the basic, you know, self-care, but it, it really is, it's a lifestyle. It's not a special event. It's not waiting to the weekend and, um, you know, driving to a location and having dinner, or it's not just picking a day in the week and saying that, you know, I'm going to get a massage. It, you know, self-care is, is really a way of life. And, uh, and I, I didn't learn that early enough. And so um, that's one thing that I think I would tell myself if, if I were 20 years younger, and that is to, you know, pay attention to what self-care really means um, and, and adopt it as, as a lifestyle versus a single one day event uh, or a one week vacation in the middle of a month. Uh, that's just not enough and that's just not sufficient. So, mm. um, so. If, if you'll allow me to turn the clock back, I promise I'll do it right this time. <laughs> uh, that, is, that really hits, that hits home. And I know it does with a lot of our viewers out there. You know, to me, self-care is a practice. I didn't know it either 20 years ago, but it's yes. a practice. It really is. And it really is. something else you said, talking about play, research also shows that play is an integral part of who we are. Yes. 
and 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 should be honored more instead of discouraged you know allowing our we learn as kids to to do it but then when we learn as we are growing up to stop doing it for some reason it's not okay but our it's we're still built to play and so yes. glad you you brought that up um betsy what about you what would you tell your self 20 years ago that you wish you would know know now <laughs> it's funny so uh, last month, I celebrated 20 years at the Community Foundation. So when you started asking that question, my brain immediately went to, you know, where was I when I came into this work? And this was still such a very young organization that we were all building the airplane as we fly it. Sorry, and I have sirens going past. Um, I think one of my things I have to really work against is comparing myself to other people. I've always had a little bit of a feeling that other people are more together than I am. They have more of their answers together in their lives than I do. And they know more about leadership and they know more about business than I do. Um, I've shed a lot of that in 20 years, not because I have seen people at their worst, um, but because I'm understanding that everybody has insecurities and you just get it done. I'm still waiting for that great wisdom that's going to come on me, especially after this year, because I intend to be wiser when I emerge from this than I went into it. And yet what I've realized, there isn't this giant light bulb that comes on and you become wise. You just do the best you can every day. And, and some days it's going to be easier than other days. And some days I feel great you know, at the end of the day about what I was able to accomplish. And other days it's like, oh, I just didn't do anything. But you just keep picking it up the next day, pick it up, keep doing it. It's not that you're faking it. I think I've actually realized the opposite. It's that everybody is more real than you realize. And by giving them permission to be real around me, maybe they'll be more real back to me. And I'll learn more. Yes. Yes. What a, what a great, great point. And the, the best, doing the best that we can in all circumstances is enough. It, it, it yeah. is, if you think about it, doing the best we can is enough. Yeah. And boy, do I wish I could have learned that as a, as a 30, 40 year old. Ooh. Melody, I'll let you tackle that one. Well, I'm sitting here listening, going, okay. One's being real curious, which I like that. Being courageous, I like that. Learning to have that downtime, that joy, that feeling. And I think all those, I'd like all those. And I think I just add to the birthday cake. I always call it as we go up. But for me, it, I think the one thing I would do is be more present. Um, and, and I think the reason for that, there have been, had a lot of things happen in my life and I never wished I'd have gone quicker. I wish I would always said, oh gosh, if I could have just done that and just listened a little more or been curious during the conversation or, you know, have a little more time just to hurt a few more words, um, you know, because it's such an intentional, it's a, it, to be really present with someone is just, they're the most important person in the world. It's very intentional. It's very focused. And I think you, they feel the most important. And so do you, you walk out of there richer and, and encouraged or, or learned. I mean, it can be tough situations that you're in too. And I think sometimes as a as life passes or certainly along the way, the moments that I remember most in my, you know, many of you all know I, I was a nurse for years um, and I had to hold the hands of people who died and take people in. I was in the ER all the time. And it's those moments when we just slow down long enough to just, have not just that empathy that you know just sharing those moments that made me who I really was and I took away from there going wow those leaders or those people who had that gift to be able to do that that's what I wanted and I think it made me more compassionate it made me more authentic it made me more real in my life um just to, those moments because I, I, I want to laugh more. I want to have joy. I want to do all those things. But I think when you're present, there's not regret. 
there's not all those things that tend to take our, our mind away from having those moments of joy and relaxation. Cause then you sit back and go, wow, you know, wow. And I think being present just lets you do that. So I find myself doing that more and more. And I have time set aside every day. My husband will not even, he goes, I'm up. I said, I hear you. And, and we don't speak. He knows that I have this routine. And before I go to bed, you know, I think of three moments of awe or three good things. And that's how I go to bed because that's the last thing I want to hear and the first thing I want to hear. So, and that's all because I just want to be present, go to sleep and enjoy your sleep, get up the next day and start it off right. And it helps me just get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I call it training your brain to look for the positive. You know, it's oh, yeah. training our brain to look for the positive instead of the, the negative. So I'm going to, our time is up and I'm going to throw you one last curveball. I'm going to ask you if you would each please give me one word that if that you would like for others to use to describe your legacy. Ooh. What is one one word that you would like to use or you would like for people to use to describe your legacy? And, and when you have that word, and this is not the only word that may describe you, but a, a word, would you just, just let me know and we'll, we'll start with you. I'll throw one out. Thank That's you. hard, Lori. I, I know, I know, but it lets people see you. So I want to be known as enabling. And that's a word that's often used in a negative context, but I mean it in a positive context. I hope that what I and, and the staff at the Community Foundation do is about enabling people to do great things yes. to build a community. So that. Yes, I, I love that. I love it, especially because it's one of those terms. It's not it, It's not automatically like, oh, I want to be authentic or I want to be courageous. <laughs> it's, a, it's a word you have to think about. And so that's a that's a great word. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll go. Um, so, so I was thinking about it, you know, and and, and I love words like integrity and, and honesty. You know, that that's that's really important to me. But, um, but when I really think about it, I, I guess I'd have to say that I care um, because it's important to me for people to know that, um, that I'm, I'm always operating from a lens that says that I really care. I care about the person. I care about the outcome. I care about the quality of what, what we accomplish. I care about your well-being. I care about... Um, you know, the condition of our community, you know, I, I care about the people that I spend time with. Um, so, so in, in the end, I, I think I'd, I'd want to use the word care uh, as that word, but I'm, I'm like Betsy, that was a really tough, tough question. And it um, wasn't on your list, was it? It was, yeah, it, it really, it really wasn't. So, um, so, you know, you, you almost ate up our time thinking, having us think about it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Oh, good word, though. Was good. What did you come up with? Wow. Well, well, look, presence. <laughs> I use the word possibilities all the time, but I'm gonna. This will be my grandson. Metamorphosis. Oh. And and I like that because he's it's it's we're we're creating. It's we're changing. We're creating. It's so you know. I think. Yeah. Metamorphosis. Yeah. <laughs> And being willing yeah. to, to it's, change. Yeah, I think, because I have to change all the time. And if you're not, you're not, you know, it's like a piece of silver being polished. I always think it's never quite polished because you never really see your reflection. And it's a metamorph. What's it going to turn into? What's the yeah. change going to look like? Exactly. And just let it be. Yeah, go with it. Wonderful. What a what a great way to wind this up. And, and I, I did this because I'm thinking about all of all of you out there watching. It it's a it's a really interesting thing to take some quiet time, reflect, think about what is it that I want my legacy to be. And that really becomes the type of leader you are. 
And that is a motivator and a driver of your, your leadership if you think about your legacy and what you want that to look like. And so I wanna thank today's panelists. It's been absolutely wonderful. I'm very inspired and motivated. I just, I feel like I'm gonna leave and change the world because you are changing the world. Uh, I wanna invite people, if you, if you have not interacted with the chamber, the chamber is a wonderful organization. I've made so many lifelong friends with just with my affiliation at the chamber. And I encourage you to reach out, utilize the networking and the educational pieces because there's always something new going on at the chamber. We'd also like to thank TSIS, our sponsor, because without our sponsors, our chamber just couldn't do the kinds of things we're able to do. And so big thank you to everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, ladies. Thanks a lot. We're going to go uh, hang out with each other because I had a great hey, time I, here. I had, I had I'd like to hang out with ball. you all too. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. Let's do it.